Hi, this is Tammy, founder of Numbers Protocol. There are many people asking in the community that they want to know more about the team. In order to respond to the request, we have designed the Behind the Project podcast. In today's Behind the Project podcast, we have invited our angel investor, Bill Chen, the chief decentralized officer of HTC and also the general partner of Race Capital. I don't think I've ever asked you questions seriously like this. <laughs> okay, um, so the first question is, so um, as a successful entrepreneur and investor, what's your opinion about the, this revolution in crypto, NFT, and Web3? Do you think if this is truly revolutionary or if it is a bubble? Um, no, I, I do think it's revolutionary. And what I'm most excited about is, is what Bitcoin started. And in Bitcoin, you always hear like these five foundational principles. It's open, it's borderless, it's permissionless, it's censorship resistant and decentralized. I think um, those five sort of features of it is what makes it revolutionary. And I think very few Bitcoin is one Ethereum and, you know, some proof of work. And um, there, there are quite a... There's not that many that actually has these type of you know, innovations uh, built into it, because anytime you compromise on you know one of these, uh, then you kind of jump back to web two again. Um, and so, my answer to is it revolutionary? You know, is it a true revolution? Is that if you compromise, then you go back to web two? Then it's then it, it absolutely is a bubble. Um, and there's a lot of schemes and mm-hmm. scams, pump and dump schemes. But if you really hold true to those uh, principles, um, then it's a true revolution. It completely changes how software it does. It, it completely changes uh, economic incentives. Uh, it completely changes how people organize and, and, and work and play and leisure together. Um, I, I think it has that big of a sort of revolutionary implication. Um, if it plays out. Yeah. So talking about openness and recently there are a lot of um, blockchain games and also a lot of NFTs, but um, actually it's very hot, um, but most of it are running on the centralized server, yeah. but still very hot. So uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so I'm torn here because I absolutely love the what's going on in the play to earn space, right? Um, and it, it and when it comes to gaming and transaction, it has to happen in these centralized. And, and there are so, several others, um, immutable X, right? These these are all. But I, you know, I understand the compromise that you need to make there. I guess the the compromises you break there are, are no longer a revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, the innovation is in the play to earn or the X to earn. I think there's a lot of interesting experimentation and things that are happening. I think it's a, that's more like an evolution right, rather than a revolution. Mm-hmm. You know, is it the kind of, but I also think because it's gaming is always the first to experiment, mm-hmm. right? Uh, since the 90s, the gamers have always been the first to adopt the newest technologies. And so I, I'm, I'm very open to, you know, these types of experiments and there's a lot to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, but because it jumps back to the Web two model, yeah. uh, it's it. In that sense, it's not revolutionary from the infrastructure and kind of foundation side. But on the application side, I think there's still a lot of innovation and, and things to learn and experiment on. So it's 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 both and mm-hmm. or neither nor. How do you want to see it? Yes. Uh, but it's still fascinating what's going on in, in the. The, the game five space, so to speak, right? Do you play any game five game? I don't play it because the thing with game five is, and this is a philosophical thing, right? Like, I play it just to learn about it, right? Like, but I actually don't have that much time to play it, right? <laughs> the thing with game five is, it's for people who have a lot of time, right? Not a lot of money, right? And people who have a lot of money, not a lot of time, they will play these type of games, right? Mm-hmm. They will farm it out. Mm-hmm. And so so that, again, 
the begs the question, is this a new type of elitist exploitation again, mm -hmm. right? Is it the next generation? Is it like mm -hmm. factory 3.0, mm -hmm. right? It, it's, a, it's a relevant question, mm -hmm. okay, right? And so, so at the same time, I understand that, you know, like in the Philippines, obviously Axie Infinity and YGG, you know, these are people who find great opportunities in making money, but like once this becomes an institution, like how 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 are these workers then yeah. protected, yeah. right? And that's a completely different question. Yeah. So um yeah, how how is that inequality being managed? Mm -hmm. And so I think I, I generally still see it as a net positive. Right. But I also see the there there are still some dark side mm -hmm. parts to it. Right. Yeah. So that's why I'm I'm more of a mixed uh, how I, in terms of how I feel about it, yeah. uh, mixed about what I feel about data. Um, so the, the next question is, um, so HTC supports many great content creators and also create content platforms like Vibar. So from your point of view, what's the challenge of the content creators today? And what going to be the impact of Web3 and NFT technologies to them? So NFT is a digital primitive, right? I actually think of and this is, is a Chris Dixon um, 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 formulation. You know, you can think of NFT like websites. You know, like early '90s, every company they want a website. I do think that every creator and every company will, uh, you know, should think of it like like a website, mm -hmm. right? And right now there are maybe seven to ten different types of NFTs. Right? There's music NFTs. There's game object as yeah. NFTs. There's access. There's redeemables, um, there's login, right? Identity NFTs. And so, yeah, I, I think um, uh, NFTs are uh, just a completely different digital primitive, right? The question to me is then, are these NFTs centralized or not? That's mm -hmm. another, those, are they compromising an open borderless permissionless censorship resistant, yeah. you know, those things? Because if you're not, then, Again, you're back to Web two, mm -hmm. right? And so there are a lot of you know uh, NFT platforms um, that are just centralized, and I don't, there's no point in, in in it being a blockchain, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, so yeah. So the question to me is that underlying blockchain, is it those five things, mm -hmm. right? That will have that effect on the NFT, right? Because I would say. This is the narrative I, I like to use. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, so the famous uh, slogan from Google is "Don't be evil," yeah. right? And then in the Web three space, uh, there's this slogan called "Can't be evil," right? Mm -hmm. Started by Blockstack. But the reality is, don't be evil, can't be evil, but I have to start evil, and trust me, I won't be evil, yeah. right? And that last part is what's very, very difficult for human nature to overcome, mm -hmm. right? Trust me, I won't be evil, yeah. right? Is once you get big, like Google, yeah. they will drop that slogan, yeah. right? Why would you, why would you get the keys of the kingdom mm -hmm. and then just give it away, right? And so starting out can't be evil is important. Mm -hmm. Again, those five things. Yeah. And if you don't start out that way, and you gain power and recognition and users and, and the whole economic model and your shareholders, mm -hmm. then, then you're back to the Web2 model. Yeah. And so I would say most of these NFTs out there are still the Web2 model, mm -hmm. right? And so again, I'm very open. And I think the creative energy that's happening in the NFT mm -hmm. space in all those different ways of thinking about it is fascinating. Mm -hmm. But the underlying uh, revolution I, I often is the compromises that you do, they often abandon mm -hmm. uh, the whole point of it, yeah. right? We lose the big picture. You know, Web3 is no longer Web3 anymore. <laughs> it's actually NFT plus Web2. Mm -hmm. Or it's not even, it's not, and then when it's that, then what's the point of an NFT? Mm -hmm. Then it's just, Web two centralized uh, game objects, yeah. and so, 
And so that's my mixed kind of feelings about what's going on in, in the NFT. Mm. So because I, I totally agree, there are a lot of NFT platforms today that are actually um, very centralized. Um, so if you have uh, good friends or creators, will you still suggest them to issue NFTs? Because it, it may end up like previously, uh, they go to Instagram or YouTube and they earn money for those platforms. But now, even though you have NFTs, but still, if you're a creator, then you're like lending on those platforms, um, you still earn money for them, um, not earning money for yourself. Um, so what's what the difference, doing? right? So, so <laughs> my question is, if you, if you have uh, creator friends, uh, will you suggest them to um, issue NFTs now, or you will suggest them to probably wait a bit until the the NFT world can be more open? More no, transparent? I would still I would still have an issue right now because because nobody knows what's going to happen, right? And there's still a lot of things we all need to learn about mm -hmm. how people are using and interacting, mm -hmm. buying and selling NFTs, mm -hmm. right? There's still so much to learn about what's what's going on, and, and um, although the infrastructure doesn't support kind of a decentralized, mm -hmm. you know, NFT type of thing or interaction, um, there's still a lot of things you need to learn before, I guess, when you port it onto the right model. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely wouldn't suggest wait till everything's figured out. Mm -hmm. True. Um, so the next question is. Um, you are the founder of many amazing products, including Exodus Bond and Vive, one for blockchain and the other one for Metaverse. So how do you see blockchain and Metaverse meeting each other in the future? And also what's the opportunity or potential do you see? So I like to think of Metaverse not as, like Mark Zuckerberg, he would define it based, the way he defines it is basically like internet plus, mm -hmm. right? I like to think of it as a point in time, like kind of an AI, like mm -hmm. singularity, right? So singularity is the point in time yeah. which uh, uh, computers become smarter than human beings, mm -hmm. right? I think metaverse, I like to think of it as that point in time in which people value digital assets mm -hmm. more than physical assets. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can expand that to um, digital relationships, uh, digital virtual experiences. Once you... And it's, it's kind of already happening, right? Well, right now, you probably spend over 50% of your time uh, in front of a screen, yeah. which is a virtual digital experience. Um, and then you spend more time, people spend more time in front of TVs plus laptops plus uh, mobile phones, right? Mm -hmm. It's at the end, it's, it's where we're putting our attention, right? And if one day we have, you know, some headset or glasses like this, then that number 50% will go up to 60, 70, 80, maybe 90, right? Um, so I, I think it's that point in time in somebody's life <clears throat> where they're spending more time and attention and value in the virtual digital world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. And so that, in the Web3 aspect of it is, okay, now that you're doing that, do you own your digital asset? Yeah. Or is it a third party that owns it? Right, and so this 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 idea of digital property then becomes of huge importance because the property now is everything about you. It's your attention. Mm -hmm. It's all your data, your shopping data, your search data, your health data, your financial data, and this goes your social graph. Right? Mm -hmm. Do you own that? Mm -hmm. Right? And do you have a choice uh, and power over controlling that mm -hmm. that that virtual part of you? I have a I have one more question related to metaverse. Um, recently, there are some media in Hong Kong that shut down, and then one of my friends uh, he posted on, on on the social media saying so he thinks that um, where they people can um, allow these media to speak and also the, the media can ex exist that's metaverse so from these uh, texts it means that they have the expectation of the metaverse in the future is where you have less regulation regulation and less censorship what's your opinion on that 
No, but that's it, back to those five things again. Yeah. It's open, borderless, mm-hmm. permission, and one of them is censorship resistant, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It has to be censorship resistant for it to be revolutionary. Mm-hmm. Or again, if it's if it's if it's permissioned, and it can be censored, mm-hmm. right? Then we're back to the web too. Mm-hmm. True. And so again, it all goes down goes back to those five principles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you compromise on one, then immediately default back to web two. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the um, the next question is the vision of numbers is to become the photo network in Web3. And in that system, the authenticity of photo can be assured. Um, so what's the biggest opportunity and the biggest challenge of numbers protocol from your point of view? So yesterday when I gave a talk, I, you know, I said something along the lines that in the future, people are not going to go on Google to search for truth anymore. People are going to go to a different search engine mm-hmm. to search for blockchain, right? For authenticity, mm-hmm. right? When Vitalik says, I'm going to donate X amount of dollars to this India crisis, you don't go check on Google, you go check on the blockchain if he yeah. did it or not, right? Yeah. That's where I'm really excited about numbers. It's like, you know, this photo that was taken by this reporter about this politician, um, is it on chain, right? Is it worthy enough to be on chain? Mm-hmm. And if it's on chain, how do I check the authenticity of it, mm-hmm. right? And the same with NFTs, what you're doing with uh, NFT search, right? Mm-hmm. Like Google's not going to do that, mm-hmm. right? I don't know why they're not doing that. I think because Google's not no longer a founder-led company. When a company is no longer founder-led, it doesn't jump or see this next wave and jump on it, like. Mark Zuckerberg obviously is a founder-led company, mm-hmm. and so he jumps from social media, jumps straight into the metaverse. Yeah. Jack Dorsey is another founder-led company, right? Twitter, Square, and boom, he's back into the block and Bitcoin. But the other companies, Google, Apple, they're, you know, Microsoft, mm-hmm. they're not in it, mm-hmm. right? And so what I'm really excited about is numbers are, are those two opportunities. One is, wow, in the future when I'm going to search for truth, like this ledger of record, what happened? In a photo, mm-hmm. I'm going to go to the numbers, right? And then what you're doing now with NFTs, like if this creator created this, like did he really create it? Mm-hmm. Created where? Like all, all these, these are really important questions. And it's getting more and more important because like right now we're seeing like Facebook, for example, there was some crazy number, like 200 million fake accounts per quarter, <laughs> right? How do you auth- authenticate it? You know, how do you know it's a human being behind this, right? And then now there's like this whole AI with GPT-3 stuff, right? Text-based, where you can generate a whole Twitter conversation with yeah, just yeah. Um, with with just bots. So then, okay, now it's so easy to generate. And this goes back to why proof of work is so amazing. It's like, okay, how do you... And, and so the question is, um, how do you... Um, uh, be able to authenticate if this is a human being mm-hmm. uh, talking or tweeting and things of that nature. I think a decentralized social media might have to use proof of work here again, right? To say that, oh, you have to do a little work to be able to show that you're mm-hmm. you're, you're a real person mm-hmm. instead of an AI, right? Like if it's just AI doing these tweets and conversations, right? And generating kind of mass uh, manipulation of, of opinions yeah. it's 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 very very scary mm-hmm. right and so we need to go back and to some ledger of record to say hey where is this photo coming from where is this nft coming from right we need some some ground source of truth right um and so that's why i'm excited about numbers yeah. talking about why google doesn't do the search engine uh, for for nft so um, that that's back to the um, or for any blockchain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that's that's um, back to. Uh, I remember that previously one day we had this conversation about the search engine of Web two and Web three. So I I still think um, the um, the core value of Web two engine and Web three engine are quite different. So for Web two, it's more like um, it has an algorithm to guess what you are looking for. Um, but Web3, just like you said, people search 
for the transaction recurrent blockchain or people will search for who created this NFT, this kind of information. So it's, it should not be the algorithm to guess what you're looking for. Well, what, you're, what, you're talk, what you're referring to is what a lot of pe people call the original sin of Web2, which is the reason why the algorithm is designed that way is because it's ad-based. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Once you have an ad-based model, yeah. then the algorithm yeah, yeah, is yeah, tuned yeah. just yeah. for that. That's true. That's true. Right? Algorithm is actually neutral. So that's right. Yeah. That's the model we have. Yes. Yeah. And so when you have an ad, when you have a purely ad-based model, mm -hmm. right? Whereas that's Web two in Web three, um, you get to do more mission-driven mm -hmm. communities, and that's what's cool about these Web three communities. It's mission-driven. It's not just ad driven mm -hmm. or attention driven, yeah, yeah. right? It's, we believe in these set core beliefs, mm -hmm. right? And we start there. And then sure, there are some economics built on top of that, but it's secondary to the mission, mm -hmm. right? I think what happened in Web2 is that completely got flopped, mm -hmm. right? And ad and attention became the number one thing. And so mm -hmm. all the algorithms is tuned for that, mm -hmm. right? Because that generates shareholder value. Um, so the next question is, um, so this is because this podcast is called Behind the Project. So the audience would like to learn more about Numbers team. And as a first angel investor of Numbers, can you please share with our community what make you make the decision to invest in Numbers? Oh, which is just because of you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think both, no, 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 but to me, because of, like, I invest in the entrepreneur because, um, like, you and Bofu were both deep in the canonical kind of open source space. And like I've been saying, like, I believe in open source. And what we were just saying is, in the Web2 era, it's all built on open source, mm -hmm. right? But it, it wasn't, uh, and then Google and Apple, they built their whole company around mm -hmm. open source, right? But it, it was an open database. It wasn't. Yeah. And so what's exciting about Bitcoin and Ethereum, these type of public blockchains, proof of work blockchains, is that it's not just open source. It's open state. It's open mm -hmm. runtime. Right. That is that I think is the next generation and the true inheritor of mm -hmm. open source. Right. That was the original promise or the original kind of ethos yeah. around it. And I think projects like Bitcoin and Ethereum do carry that ethos mm -hmm. of open source, open state, open runtime. Mm -hmm. Linux didn't take it far enough. And then it's not just open source, open state, open runtime. And then they have a whole economics yeah, yeah. and incentive model of tokenomics built around it. Yeah. Um, and, <clears throat> and and I think you guys understood that. You guys share that ethos, which is why uh, um, I, I really like your team. Uh, you and Bo Fu. Um, and you guys were, I mean, you guys understand open source more than I do, right? Because you guys actually worked in that space, right? Uh, and you guys uh, managed open source communities. You guys brought communities together. And I think that's the key in Web3 is have you ever managed a virtual digital community and doing collaborative global projects together? And you guys did that. And so it was a natural thing for me to push you guys into sort of this numbers protocol. Mm -hmm. It was so so natural and easy for you guys to do that too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like I didn't try to push other entrepreneurs <laughs> into doing. They don't. Care, but you know, if you're stuck in your web two ways, right? But you were stuck in your, you were you grew up in open source mm -hmm. and Linux and canonical. It was such a natural um, extension to the way you guys think and manage teams. And build products, and so that's why I invested in, yeah. in you guys. Recently, I, I joined the panel, and in that panel, they asked us a question uh, about Web three community. How how do you manage the community in Web three? And then um, I share with the host uh, about how what we do at, at Numbers, and I also share with them that I do think in the um, growing with the community and uh, building everything with community, it's really in the nature of every Web3 project. And 
it's actually much easier said than done because um, it's more much more than like uh, talking to the community and, and chatting on Discord or Telegram, but it's more like uh, how do you get the real feedback from the community and then adapt those feedback into the project and then um, make community part of your development pipeline. And I, I think uh, we are also still learning and trying to uh, create that uh, community uh, building process um, but also I, I think I'm, we are really excited about the this nature of web3 because we really love it and, and I think it's really interesting to have the community being part of your development process and uh, get their feedback on almost everything of what you do uh, I saw a lot of projects they uh, they don't like community because they think community is, is like a, a customers. So they see their Telegram channel or Discord channel as a customer service. So every time community asking questions there, and they will say, okay, I can help you to solve that. Let's do the direct message. Um, but we never do direct message because we think it should be an open space where everybody talking here and then you can see the conversation is transparent and we can all participate in the discussion together. So I think that's Yeah, because because now you're treating people as a partner and co developer, right? Yeah, and yeah, definitely. Which is what you guys did with the open source community. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. But just in a deeper, more engaging way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next question is um so if you can only pick one what is the service or the company that you really think they should use Nimbus for? I would just say all the top uh, media companies, mm -hmm. right? That actually want to build some integrity in mm -hmm. their, their journalism, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Especially in America, when you, when, when you say the press is the fourth estate, right? Mm -hmm. People call America a uh, uh, state controlled by the press yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so the press it's it's that's of central importance because it manages and manipulates it controls uh, whatever you want to use the opinion of its people mm -hmm. and when you have and when you can get you can say anything online when you can get AIs to say it not even human beings mm -hmm. um, and then there's no way of authenticating it. Then, then nobody knows what's real and what's mm -hmm. fact and what's 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 ground truth anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would say, um, not one company, but any serious media journalist uh, that that want to build a higher integrity mm -hmm. uh, to the source and truth of their their photos. Um, and I, you know, it doesn't have to be um, a journalist. It can just be anybody, any citizen journalist, even, right? Who wants to start building a more, uh, you know, some human collection of photos that has some more integrity and authenticity mm -hmm. to it. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a daunting task, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a. But yeah, like I said, the press is such an important mm -hmm. and photos and uh, is of central importance for, for, for that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So yeah. Okay. So I think that's all the questions. Thank you for joining this podcast today. We will also invite other advisors and partners, investors to share their views in the future. So thank you everyone who is listening. Let us know on Telegram, Twitter, or Discord how you think about this behind the project. Talk to you next time. Bye.